the standards such as divine feelings such as worldliness such as this, that, and the other. But when it comes down to the tripod of truth, the three things that God's church, is, that God's church stands on, it is justification, sanctification, and unity of God's people. So we're going to break these down tonight, and we want to make sure as long as we keep these in the midst, God is moving. God is blessing. God is doing a great work. As long as we keep these three in the midst, and we don't let nothing at all come against these three. Amen. As long as we understand the principles of justification, amen, truly being born again with a real experience. I'm going to get to each one. the scriptures to back up each one. But as long as we have an atmosphere in which a person can truly be justified for real, right with God, amen, aligned with God for real, if we maintain an atmosphere in which someone can come in and really get justified, delivered for real, maintain, amen, we maintain an atmosphere in which an individual can understand sanctification, have the inspiration to get sanctified, truly sold out to God for real, amen, all kinds removed, but completely sold out to God. Amen. God can do his will with your life. My God, what a powerful atmosphere. And if we maintain an atmosphere of the unity of God's people, amen. God's people working together as one. Not this denomination, that denomination, this, that, and the other, but really understand what the Bible says about God's family, God's people. See, God's church is his family. Who wants their family to be divided? Who wants their family to be in this and that and that? You would be broken hearted. If you were a real parent and you had two children and those two children, for whatever reason, they're not talking to each other. They don't like each other. They go from this side of the town and they go to that. That parent is grieved. You will find that Jesus, he understood this. That's why he prayed one of the most significant prayers of his life about this third part. My God. And many people today don't understand these. But we're going to break these down by the help of God in just the short time that we have that you have this in your arsenal. We must maintain justification. Don't let nobody come in and tell you that you can't be delivered from all sin. Don't let nobody come in. And it blows me away how some people understood this, but now I'm endeavoring to work with them and I'm invited to a place real, real soon and I got to deal with the fact that they once understood this. Their book said this. Their founders wrote this down in their, in their uh, uh, book of discipline. This is what they taught. This is what they stood on. But men crept in and they became worldly. So therefore they no longer teach this. This was the foundation that you were in sin. You get saved. God delivers you and you live a holy life. But now they don't understand it. Their children are coming up. Don't understand this at all. This is the foundation this is the reason that Jesus came. We're going to break this down tonight. And they don't understand sanctification. They used to. They would preach this and they would have magazines and books and newspapers that were sent all over America declaring you can get sanctified, sold out, consecrated. This is the will of God. But now no longer teach this. Many understood the unity of God's people. In the first seal you'll see in the book of Acts, you'll see even before that with Jesus crying and preaching the churches. They proclaim unity of God's people. Not this denomination, that denomination. We're going to look in the word of God because the devil knows if I can some type of way get this, then I can get this, and then I can get this. Or if I can some type of way work on this order, however I do it, I got to work. I got to find a way to get things on fire. I got to find a way to get them divided. I got to find a way to get them separated. Get you against you and you against you. You got to reject all divisions. You got to reject that foolishness. You got to understand what God says about it and what it means to God. That's why he called it. You touch this, it's sin. If you touch this, it's sin. If you touch this, it's sin. Call it what you want to call it. Label it how you want to label it. Put it how you want to put it. But if you deal with the people of God and you're endeavoring to defy the people of God, he called it what it is. It's sin. If you deal with sanctification and you want to take the cleansing out, you are, that's false doctrine. That is hearsay. If you take out justification, then the person is not even saved. So tonight, we're going to look at all three of these in the little time that we have, and we're going to break them down by scripture. But more importantly, I want you to get the spirit of this. That if you ever see anything at all that come up against any of these, you have enough Holy Ghost discernment to say that's not of God, that's not church of God. All right, go over to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Pray for it. We're going to get a little bit of time, but we're endeavoring to have this foundation. The big three, maintain the big three, the tripod of truth. Romans 5, 1. Come on and read. Therefore being justified by faith. Therefore being justified by faith, not by works. Not because of where you grew up, my parents were justified. No, you get to have personal faith. Justified means to be made right with God. The person was guilty. It's really a legal term. A person was guilty. They came to God 
in prayer. The blood of Jesus. That's why no other name can a person be saved. You can read whatever book you want to read, talk about meditation, talk about Eastern religion, all this other stuff. You've got to understand what it means to be guilty before God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Created in sin. So at some point you sin. And you need somebody to atone. It's not about you joining church. It's not about you getting better. It's not about you meditating. But you, somebody got to pay for what you did. And the only way you're going to be justified, clear to God, is to have faith in Jesus. Follow his word. He said, repent of your sins. Own them. With broken and contrition. God, I'm sorry. I've been sleeping around with folk. I'm, not, I'm sorry. Playing a lot of lying stuff. I'm sorry, God. I've sinned against you, and I'm asking you to forgive me. You forgive me, I'll live you for the rest of my life. I'm sorry, God. I acknowledge your son, Jesus, and I'm surrendering my life to him. And see, when you really meet the condition, God will save you. God will forgive you. He'll take the blood, wipe your slate clean. The Bible said as far as the east is from the west, so far he's removed your sins from you. You stand justified. Although you committed sin, in the past, because you came to Christ, surrendered your whole life, you stand justified. Now, this is what the purpose for Christ even coming. Isaiah 35, 4. Come on and read. We've got to fly through these scriptures to support the first tripod or the first of the big three. Isaiah prophesied that he was coming to save us. Sin was the issue. We were bound by sin. But Isaiah said, don't be discouraged. The Messiah is coming. Come on and read. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, uh -huh. be strong. Yes. Fear not. Is Isaiah 35, 4? Come on and read. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Come on. Even God with a recompense. Yes. He will come and save you. Amen. This is the purpose. He's going to come and save you. He's going to come. Now watch how he backed it up. Matthew 1, 21. Let's line this up like a puzzle. Come on and read. And she should bring forth the son. Now this is talking about Christ in the womb of his mother Mary, who his father was going to uh, uh, do away with. The angel said, don't do away with her. She didn't cheat on you. She's about to have a child by the Holy Ghost. But he goes further and tells you the purpose. Isaiah prophesied that he would come and say, justify. Come on and read. And she shall bring forth the son. And she shall bring forth the son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, Emmanuel. Come on and read. Savior. Read. For he shall save his people. Why call him Savior? Because he shall save his people. From their sins. From their sins. Come on. Luke 175. So here you've seen the prophet said, that's why he's coming. The angel told Joseph, that's what his purpose is for. Luke 175. Come on, read. Go back to verse, four, uh, one verse. That he would grant unto us. That he would grant unto us. That we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, uh -huh. might serve him without fear. Uh -huh. In holiness uh -huh. and righteousness before him all the days of our life. He would save us so we can live in holiness and righteousness, not in the millennium, not in some future age. But all the days of our life. That's what salvation is. You live saved all the days of your life. Go over to Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3. How shall we escape? How shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation. If we, shall, if we neglect so great salvation. Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. Uh huh. And was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Come on, the disciples. So here he said, how should we escape if we neglect the salvation, the just, justified experience is available now. He said, how should we escape if we neglect it? It's not available in some future age, but it's available right now. Go to Rome, I mean, 1 Corinthians 1, 21. Let's line up and let's see the purpose of preaching. So we've seen the prophet said, we've seen Joseph was explained to him. In Isaiah, he said, we shall live in holiness all the days of our life. Hebrews said, don't neglect the salvation now. It's here now. 1 Corinthians 1, 21, read. For after, that is the wisdom of God, uh -huh. the world by wisdom do not God. Yes. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching yes. to save them that, that believe. It's not real preaching if it ain't saving nobody. This is what 
a Christian is, if you whatever you're doing, if at the end of what you're doing, a person's not saved from sin, then you're not preaching. You giving a lecture? You said upon a lecture. You said upon a dignified uh, uh, or, or oratorical uh, presentations. But if at the end of the day, the individual does not have the understanding and inspiration to repent from all sin, be turned away from all sin, to be delivered from all sin, to be saved, to, to walk in the newness of life. Go over to First John chapter three, verse five. This is the essence. Of why he was manifested. Come on and read. First John 3 5. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sin. This is his purpose for coming. Come on and read. And in him is no sin. And in him is no sin. Read. Whosoever yes. abideth in him. Yes. Sin is not. Because you say, whosoever abideth in him, that's how you can tell who's really saved. The temptation come, the devil come, say, commit sin, this, that, and the other. But God gives you a grace. First of all, when you get regenerated, he takes that desire out of you to do sin. That's why the Bible said, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. So the desire to commit sin, he removes that. You don't want to do it no more. And I think in Philippians, he said, he'll bring in you the will and do of his good pleasure. The desire and the ability. The desire, the will, I don't want to do wrong. And he'll give you the, the power. We can't do it on ourselves. Right. So he gives us grace Amen. to tell the devil, no. Come on and read, brother. Go to verse number uh, seven. Little children. Yes. Let no man deceive you. Don't let nobody come to you to try to take this out. Read. He that do it righteousness yes. is right. That's who's righteous. Don't, I'm not I'm arguing with you about what you believe. No. He that liveth is the fruit. You can tell a tree by its fruit. Read, brother. He that doeth righteousness yes. is right. Come on. Even as he is right. Yes. He that committed sin yes. is of the devil. Come on. For the devil stood from the beginning. This is what the devil does. I mean, we're, we're of his nature. We're of his kingdom. When we go and we're doing things that are not right. Verse number 8. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested. He goes back again. This purpose of the Son of God manifested. That he might destroy the works of the devil. That he might destroy the works of the devil. All right. So this right here is very, very essential because it's really the essence. Mankind created holy, they fall in the garden. A schoolmaster, the law, was to lead us to Christ, but it couldn't produce the holiness in life. So God had to send his son, and the Bible says that what the blood, what the blood of bulls and goats could not do, the blood of Jesus could do. So under the law, we couldn't live a just, we couldn't live a whole life. So God had to send Jesus to die on the cross with more power in his blood to deliver us, change us, equip us so that we can walk in the newness of life and live a justified experience. That's really the difference between the two kingdoms. That's really the difference between God's people versus the people of the world. It's not what church you go in, not this, that, that. It's are you saved? At the end of the day, when you stand before God, what did you do with my son? Because only my son could have done away with your sins. Right, this God. right here must be protected. Amen. Don't let nobody come in here and shift this. Don't, Don't let nobody sin. talk to you. I'll talk to you regarding this is the purpose that Christ came. So that we can be justified, saved from sin, walking in the goodness of life. And he'll give us strength. He'll give us the power. All right, real quickly, go over to 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. First Thessalonians 4, 3, read. For this is the will of God. For this is the will of God. Even your sanctification. Even the san sanctification is the will of God. This is what God wants. You say, brother, really, what is sanctification? Sanctification is when a person consecrates their life, they've been born again, and now they consecrate their life for God to use our EC fit. And that selfish nature, that element of self that's still there, is crucified, is burnt up when the person pays the full price. And this is what Jesus, go over to uh, John 17. John 17, read verse number maybe. 15. I pray. I pray. Not 
that thou shouldst take them out of the world. He prayed for his disciples. Said, Don't take them out of this world. You want to read? But that thou, would, thou shouldst keep them, the keep them from the evil. But keep them from evil. How you going to do it? You want to read? For they are not of the world. Yes. Even as I am not of the world. You want to read? Sanctify. Yes. Them through thy truth. So here, <laughs> Jesus prayed. Paul told the church that that's like a sanctification is the will of God. Jesus in his prayer said, don't take them out of this world because I need the world to see their light. But I don't want the world to get into them. So I need you to sanctify them. Over in Ephesians, he said, we're sealed with the spirit of God. That's, that's that sealing of our experience. Gives us a, a, a top put on our experience. That don't mean the top can never be taken off. But it means that that top is on there that if we go through some things in life, we don't have to worry about that contamination getting in. All right? So here, as soon as he saw the disciples come in Acts 19, the first thing he asked, Acts 19, 1, he said he saw some disciples coming. The apostles did. They said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Since you believe? Yeah. Sanctification is essential. We can't let anybody come in and do away with it. We got to actually oh preach it that it's understood and that it, the inspiration is present for them to tap into it. If they yeah. don't, it'll be all type of problems in the church. It'll be all type of problems in the experience. There won't be a consistency. There won't go over to Titus. Go over to Titus real quick. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. He breaks it down in the two-part aspect. Titus 2, 14. Not giving heed to Jewish fables uh -huh. and commandments. 2, 14. <coughs> Who gave himself forth. Who gave himself forth. That he might redeem us from all of it. That he might redeem us. That's right here. This is what this does. Look how he lighted it up. That he might, Jesus gave himself forth on the cross. That he might redeem us from all. Redeem means to bring out. He, he redeemed us. He purchased us. He redeemed us. If something you put into the uh, 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 um, place downtown where you go take stuff. Uh, pawn shop. Pawn shop, right? And you go redeem it. That means you bring it back. All right, he redeemed. We were in sin. He redeemed us out. That he went. You what, Frank? Redeemed us from what? He redeemed us from all of it. Not some iniquity. Not two packs of eggs or one pack. But that's the power of God to actually yeah. redeem a person where it, there's no dirt on you. All right now. You might need to grow and get stronger in the area, stronger in the word. But there's no dirt on you. You can follow me around. Ain't no dirt on you. You're not doing dirt in no time. You you redeemed from all iniquity. But he didn't stop there. Come on, boy, Frank. Redeem us from all iniquity uh -huh. and purify unto himself. And purify. Thank sanctification you. purifies. He yeah. redeemed us from all sin, and then he purified us from that carnal nature. Right. He redeemed us from all sin. This is a tr the truth. He says here he redeemed us from all iniquity. But that carnality, that, 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 that uh, 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 propensity to still fight uh, and defend yourself, this, that, and the other, and still have that little element of a, 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 a desire, perhaps, for some things of the world is still there, although you don't do them, but it could be something in there that might kind of desire to sometimes. He said, I'm going to purify, purify. Somebody get on your nerves, amen. You, 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 you may not cuss them up, but you kind of want to. You know what I'm saying? So you, 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 you may not do, but, but something in you is still there that you got to hold down, that you got to spend for, I got to hold down. I want to I go off, but I got to hold down. You need to go get sanctified. If you've gotten saved, this is what sanctification is. My God, go over to Romans 12. He tells us how to do it. Come on, read. we got to have this in our midst. This has got to be clear in our midst. After a person gets saved, they go and they consecrate. They say, God, there's something left there. I'm not doing wrong, but there's something left there. Yeah. There's something that needs to be dealt with there. Lord, there's something still there that's still bothering me. Come on, read. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, he said, For I am crucified with Christ. Yeah. Nevertheless, I live. But yet not I, but Christ yeah. lives in me. Sanctification is a crucifixion of that old woman, that old man. But here he says how to do it. Come on, read. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Yes. By the mercies of God. By the mercies of God. That you present your bodies uh -huh. a living sacrifice. Present your bodies, your lives, a living sacrifice. Lord, I'm coming to get sanctified. I'm going to present myself a living sacrifice. However you want to use me, you. Whatever you want to do, we do it. I want to be all. Well, you know what? I always wanted to be this, and I still, I'm saved, but I'm going me. I'm going here. I'm going. Lord, it don't even matter. All I am and hope to be, I commit to Lord to thee. Father, burn me up. That still element of self. 
that piece of me that still is struggle submitting to the perfect will of God. That still element of me that want to do what I want to do. That they just can't seem that I struggle just fully surrendering everything to, to God's perfect will. I want to be saved. I don't want the world. But there's an element that I'm just, I'm, Lord, that piece, I want to burn out. Amen. That piece, I want to be done with. Lord, I believe you. Now, see, you got to inspire faith because you know what? Some folks don't even got the faith to understand that that peace can be dealt with. And they live their whole experience holding down that peace. They, 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 they make excuses for that peace. They just say, it's just the way I am. It don't have to be the way you are. You're able to go and get that peace. Crucified, right. burn up, my God. You're able to get delivered from that thing. That's the power of the church. If we ever lose this, I'm not talking about in theology. I'm not talking about it's what we say we believe in. If, but if this is ever not an active part of the church, we are in trouble. Just like if this is not a real active part of the church, we got people coming around that are yet committing sin, yet hypocrite, yet doing stuff they know ain't right, but still come around. Oh, I'm still saying, I'm still saying. That's the atmosphere we got for real. Church of God, folk come in, my God, been here five months, six months, just whatever, and they really don't even know what this means. We can't have that. Man. Not have a real church. These three have to be active and maintained. Also, around here, year two, years, six months, whatever it is, still is carnal's grass. Still difficult for you to measure. And that's why we'll have an atmosphere where folk ain't measuring. They're not really consecrated. So it's imperative. That we understand that those three, that's as far as I better get in regards to the first two and understanding it. But our, ma our major purpose tonight is to connect all three, not preach on all three. So justification is essential. Sanctification is essential. Now let's deal with this last one. Over to uh, Psalms 133. Psalm 133, verse number 1. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Mm -hmm. How good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. Unity of God's people is essential. There is only one body. God only has one body. And I'm going to show you in Scripture. The body should not be divided. From a human perspective, the human body has various parts, but all of the same body. You mean the body is organic. I don't have to tell my finger and my leg to get along with each other, it's organic. When you're a part of the body, usually it's organic. It doesn't take a foreign or outside source to cause my body to be in one accord. In fact, if my body is not in one accord, that means that there's something wrong. If my arm is just doing what it want to do, <laughs> some ain't right. I ain't telling them to do that. This brain ain't telling them. Some ain't right. If division is ever made, some ain't right. Some ain't right. Some ain't right. Something ain't right. Something ain't right. Pray for me. This is going to get heavy. Just in a few minutes I got. Pray for me. A person who fights for division or for a denomination, they don't fully understand the principle of truth on the subject in the New Testament. Do you know what a denomination means? It means that I'm a part of this division of the Christian faith. Go to John 17. Pray for me tonight. We ain't got much time. Pray for me tonight. I'm sorry. We're going to go there. Go to Ephesians 2.16. We're reconciled into one body. Write that down. I'm just going to flow for just a couple minutes. We're reconciled into one body. Ephesians 2.16, by the cross. Read. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body. These are Jews and cross. Gentiles are reconciled into not two bodies, not 50 bodies, but one body. We're called into one body. Colossians 3.15. Come on. Somebody else give me 1 Corinthians. Matter of fact, Mother 12, give me 1 Corinthians 12, 13. We're baptized into one body. What I call for. Frank, Colossians 3, 15. Come on. 
Yes. Sister Brittany, give me Colossians 1.18. Christ is the head of one body. Come on. And let the peace of God. And let the sister Kamila give me Romans 12.4. Christ is the head of one body. Alright? So we're called into one body. Colossians 3.15. Read. And let the peace of God. And let the peace of God. Rule in your heart. Rule in your heart. To the which also uh -huh. you are called in one body. You are reconciled or born into one body. You are called into one body, out of sin, into one body. You were not called in some division. You were called into one body. You're baptized. Who got that? Go to drill. First Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit uh -huh. are we all baptized uh -huh. into one body. Into one body. Christ is only the head of one body. Colossians 1, 18. Read. And he is the head of the body. The church is only one body. The church is only one church. It's only one body. The first, that's good. The firstborn from the dead. Romans 12, 4. Come on and read. For as we have many members. We got many members. In one body. In one body. Everything in scripture speaks about one body, one body, one body, one body. And all members have not the same office. Come on and read. And all members not, have not the same office. All right. Go to John 17, 11. Let's see what Christ prayed for. John 17, 11. And now I I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Go to, go to verse 20. 17, 20. We're going to come back to 11. Come on, Rachel. Neither pray I for these alone, uh -huh. but for them also who shall believe on me through their word, uh -huh. that they may be one. God, he's praying. Lord, help them to be one. Don't let somebody come up, some man, some system come up and say, follow me over here, follow me over there, follow me over there. Uh, uh, I'm going to be able to visit the pot. No, we're one. I don't care what sacrament you enjoy. We're one. I love baptism is important. Baptism, baptism is important. But we're not, we're not that. We're of one body. We're only one body. I appreciate all the great people that's ever been used to do a thing for God. But we're not of them. We're only of one body. Okay, now we're going to break down. Pray for me tonight, saints. We're going to break down what does it take to be Oh no, let me just make it clear. The Bible speaks firmly against any division. Go to 1 Corinthians 1.10. Read. Come on, read. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians. I beseech you, brother. Yes. By the same, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. That you all speak the same thing. Come on. And that there be no divisions among Don't let it be no divisions. Oh my God. I wouldn't even let somebody frame in my mouth, I'm a part of this denomination. I'm not. The Bible said, let there be no divisions among you. I'm not. You said, well, Lee, are you all, are you all is the Bible not, is the church of God non-denominational? No, we're not non-denominational. We're biblical. You know what the biblical position on division is? Anti. We're anti-denomination. The Bible speaks against it, so I can't be neutral on the subject. First of all, I'm not going to be a part of nothing divisive. And then I'm not going to be just neutral. Because the Bible ain't neutral. Jesus cried, don't do it. In Corinthians, don't do it. It's only one. Don't do it. We got to be biblical. That's why the church of God says back to the uh, blessed old Bible. My God. Get back to the Bible. 